In this video, we're going to talk about three things I changed in my strength training program which helped me run over 11 meters per second for the first time in my life at 31 years old. By the end of this video, you'll come away with three actionable tips you can use to get more out of your strength training as it relates to speed development. The tips I'm about to share with you not only helped me run faster, but also played a major role in Su Bing Chan setting the Asian record in the 100 meter dash at 9.83 seconds at the Tokyo Olympics, where he also ran the fastest ever 60 meter dash split in history, covering the first 60 meters of the race in 6.29 seconds. Seconds. I even use this method to help athletes on my track team go from running in the 12s to breaking 11, so I know this works for a number of athletes at different levels of their progression. So if you want to develop blazing speed and get the most out of your strength training, stick around to the end of this video. The first tip that we're going to discuss here is that you need to focus on early bar acceleration and movements, which can be monitored using a metric like time to peak velocity. I use the E node sensor, which you can see in a link below. TPV is a metric that shows you how long it takes for a weight to reach peak velocity in a movement. This indicates the duration of time over which you are actively accelerating the bar during the lift, which to me is quite relevant for sprinting because what are we doing every step? Accelerating our body off of the ground in short periods of time. This is relevant because our ability to produce force in short time frames is dependent upon the stimuli applied to the body through training. I've posted about this before on Instagram where rate of force development, if you are doing things that are very heavy and slow, they help rate of force development significantly, but typically longer duration rate of force development is what improves. Whereas as you have to do other things to improve early phase rate of force development or short duration rate of force development, which is the quality that we need in sprinting. If all we ever do in the gym is lifts which take a thousand milliseconds to accelerate to peak velocity, when we only have a hundred milliseconds or less on the ground in sprinting to accelerate our body off the ground, we run the risk of shifting our nervous system to being good at long duration force production at the expense of short duration force production. If you've ever spent months doing deep squats and felt less explosive despite being stronger, this might be the reason why. Sure, there are some athletes who can just simply deep squat heavy and they see great transfer to their sprinting. But not everybody is like this and I believe that some athletes, especially those who may not be quite as reactive as others, need to do things which train their body to be more reactive and to produce rate of force development in very short time frames. If you pick up a bar velocity sensor like the E-Node, you can keep track of your lifts and monitor time to peak velocity as you get closer to the competitive season. Early in your training, you do not have to worry about this because you can just do slow, heavy lifts because we really want to focus on getting stronger from a maximal strength perspective earlier in the year and the best way to do this is to use large full range of motion heavy slower types of exercises where you're still trying to move the bar as fast as you can but it takes a long time to accelerate the bar and it's a relatively slow movement because of the load and the range of motion but as you get closer to needing to be at your best it's important to start emphasizing exercises which exhibit a lower time to peak velocity which feature very rapid early phase rate of force development and an overall more reactive and explosive nature so the question now becomes, how do we get to these lower TPV numbers and when should we do so? This brings us to tip number two, which is you need to reduce ranges of motion progressively throughout training cycles as you move through a year of training. This doesn't mean that every single exercise you do needs to be a short range of motion exercise, but for the very taxing movements you do like squats, cleans, step ups, you know, the primary lifts you might be using in a strength training program for sprinters, they need to exhibit a reduced range of motion as you progress through the competitive season. The simplest way to shift the duration of time to peak velocity and emphasize early rate of force development in strength training exercises is to modify the ranges of motion of your movements. Early in the year you want to use full range of motion exercises like deep squats, high box step ups, Romanian deadlifts, etc. to build muscles, tendons, and teach the nervous system to activate high threshold motor units and produce large amounts of force. These slower exercises are great for building strength, providing a significant stimulus for adaptation, and for building healthy tendons which can help prevent injury and improve performance. Eventually though, there are diminishing returns with regard to pushing heavier and heavier weights and the physiological cost of these exercises can start to impede your ability to sprint fast on the track. As we progress through the preseason, we need to shift some of our training towards shorter TPV exercises and we can do this by reducing ranges of motion in our lifts. For example, a deep squat might progress to a half squat, then a quarter squat, then a quarter squat to a box, and then to a very shallow drop squat near the end of the year. As these ranges of motion are reduced, you'll be able to drop and reverse weights more rapidly at joint angles that are similar to what you will be in when you're sprinting. While many will write these exercises off as useless, the fact is that you have to work very hard to produce a high eccentric and concentric rate of force development, and the reduced range of motion of these exercises forces you to make this reversal occur very quickly. When I've done these, I've found that sometimes it's much harder than simply lifting a heavy weight through a full range of motion because you have to work very hard mentally using your nervous 
nervous system to stop that weight very fast when it's going down and then initiate movement very rapidly going back up and you have to do this very quickly and when you have heavy loads on your back and you're doing a short range of motion exercise where you're trying to stop it as fast as possible and then reverse it back up as quickly as possible this is very tough to do so the people who will say this is a waste of time I suggest that they try it because it's far more challenging than you might think and I have found that simply doing full range of motion exercises like deep squats does not transfer to this ability as well as you might think when I've gone from being very strong in deep squats to then doing this type of work it took me quite a lot of time to get very good at doing this type of work which tells me there are some specific adaptations of this type of work which are neglected if you never do this type of work when doing exercises like low box step ups you can reach peak velocity in under 150 milliseconds which means that you're developing force very quickly early in the movement and this is exactly the quality we need when applying force to the track and sprinting some example progressions might be going from a 12 inch step up to an 8 inch box to a 6 inch box and then finishing with a 4 inch box near the end of your season or a deep squat might turn into a half squat then a quarter squat a quarter box squat and then a drop squat a full clean might turn into a power clean from the floor then a hang power clean and then a drop hang clean where you're trying to drop and reverse as quickly as you can and if you're doing drop jumps you might start with an 18 inch box then drop down to a 12 inch box then an 8 inch box then a 6 inch box so that way the ground contact times during those drop jumps are getting shorter and shorter as the year goes on and you're having to wire your nervous system to produce force in shorter time frames the point here is that we want to shift some of our lifting throughout the year to get as close to the rate of force development demands of sprinting as possible. This helps to ensure that the strength we have can be applied rapidly when we sprint, and I do not believe that simply lifting heavy through full ranges of motion all year can produce the same effects as this approach I'm discussing here. If it did, I would have run 11 meters per second a lot sooner in my life because I spent years focusing on heavier, slower types of movements, and once I implemented this type of training into my own training program, all of a sudden I was setting personal personal bests, particularly in the top speed zone and speed endurance zones of my sprints. The final tip I have is that you need to make sure that your program is simple enough that you can actually get better at the exercises you do without cluttering the adaptive signals you are sending to your body. I believe that if you spread yourself thin doing 20 different exercises in a workout, you'll be hard pressed to identify which exercises your body will adapt to the most. If we simplify our exercise selection to a few primary exercises each workout, we can stay focused on getting better at those exercises and increase the probability that our bodies will adapt specifically to those demands and not something else that may be less important. Now if you want to make sure you can apply force to the ground properly in sprinting, check out this video here on sprinting technique.